What's that on your shirt? Musky slime. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Yens, guys? Welcome back to Fishing PA with Ryan Reed. Guys, in this episode, we're gonna continue on with our video casting, and I've got a few special guests to talk to tonight. Now, you guys know I'm a huge advocate of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission hatcheries. Now, guys, I thought that this video was the golden opportunity to highlight the hardworking staff in all of the hatcheries across the state of Pennsylvania. So our guest for tonight, we're gonna have the one and only Jared Sayers on, He's the manager for the Linesville State Fish Hatchery. And then also, we're going to have two local fishermen, one of which is a premier bait maker, Mr. Evan Schoss. I'm going to say the CEO of the Schoss Bait Company. Always wanted to introduce the CEO. And also, Mr. Charlie Mueller. He's the secretary of our Chapter 16 Muskies, Inc. And also, Charlie has a lot of background with fish breeding. So guys, I'm super excited about this particular video cast. We're going to take some time and we're going to talk about the hatcheries. We're going to talk about what the hatcheries do for you as a fisherman across the whole state of Pennsylvania. We're going to talk about the muskie program. We're going to talk about the steelhead program. Jared's got a lot of good information on catfish and bass. You guys know that I respect Jared and I respect PA Fish and Boat. And this is truly an honor for me to sit down with these guys and really talk hatcheries and talk fishing. Guys, I'm just super pumped, I'm super excited, and I'm feeling super thankful to get this group of guys together and talk fishing and talk hatcheries because the hatcheries are really the lifeblood behind what you guys know is the sport of fishing in the state of Pennsylvania. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the Zoom call and hopefully you guys find this information to be beneficial. What is up, Yin's guys? All right, tonight we have a few guests on that I am super excited about. Uh, first and foremost, we got Mr. Jared Sayers from the Linesville Fish Hatchery. We got Evan Schoss from Schoss Bait Company, and we got Mr. Charlie Mueller. So tonight we're going to talk about the Linesville Hatchery. We're going to talk about PA Fish and Boat Hatcheries in general and really get a good idea of maybe what the hatcheries do uh, for us as fishermen throughout the state of Pennsylvania. And we're going to take some time to just drill Jared with some questions. So does that sound good, guys? Is that uh, the format here for tonight? Sounds good to me. It's always right. good to have a punching bag. <laughs> All right, so Jared, I, I want to start off with, you know, maybe you can give us some background into your role at the hatchery there in Linesville, and then maybe just kind of explain what you guys do at the hatcheries in general, if that's fair, if we're okay to start there. Yeah, sure. I mean, just cut me off and steer me in a direction because that's a pretty open-ended question. But, um, you know, I feel pretty lucky to be, you know, working as a hatchery manager. It's always what I wanted to do. And uh, to be at the Linesville hatchery where there's so many different things going on is just, it's key, you know. We have a lot of great trout hatcheries around the around the state, and they do a lot for the trout anglers. Um, but it's kind of a one-trick pony, you know what I mean? They it's all built up for one season, and then once they get the fish out, and they're kind of done and waiting for the next season. Where in the warm water hatcheries like Lionsville, you know, we always got something new going on, and there's always you know a, a catfish stocking at a lake that I want to see how it pans out three years later, or um, a really good class of walleye yearlings that. Um, the biologist found after one of our stockings and there's things that I follow up on that really is what I find exciting these days is it's you know I'll talk to a biologist over lunch and he's talking about how many how much the bait fish population is booming in a lake and then we go and we put a bunch of channel cats and walleyes in there and they take off you know just trying to figure out what the timing is of getting a good successful year class so that the there's a fish, you know, of a particular species in a lake for the anglers to enjoy for years to come, you know, and that's, you know, and that's the same kind of thing that I think has worked so well for the muskie program is that now we've switched to not only the larger fish, but it's a, it was a whole mentality switch where we changed from 
you know, getting as many muskies out in many different places and scattered all over the state, we switched our whole mentality to saying, let's get a quality product out that's going to live and just target our resources to where we can create destination waters where guys can go and really have a good time fishing for muskies, not go and get, continually be frustrated or hope to you know, at least just see a fish. You know, now we have lakes where guys can go and expect to catch a fish, let alone some of these lakes that are really producing. Now we go have multiple fish days. That was just unheard of 10 years ago. Yeah, sure. that, I think that, so that's a good summary. I mean, I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand what type of impact you guys have on the fishery. Um, just generically speaking, I run into a lot of fishermen, various places that don't really have a good understanding of, you know, they're catching these walleye or they're catching catfish or they're catching a muskie and they don't necessarily understand like what it takes for that fish to be in that body of water and then ultimately end up in their net. I mean, is that fair? Do you guys feel like maybe there's a percentage of the, the fishing population that just doesn't have an idea? I think there's a, there's a lot of people out there that just take it for granted. You know, they think that these fish are just in these lakes and they're catching them and they reproduce on their own or, you know, maybe especially with the warm water fish, you know, I think it's different whenever you have a, a trout stocking list that's published every year and guys know exactly when these fish are going to be put in and there's a ramp up towards the season. But, you know, a lot of the stuff you guys do is kind of in the cover of the dark per se, you know, like you don't, you don't get the hype that everybody else gets, but yet you guys are the lifeblood of a lot of these PA fisheries, you know, and I, I think that you know, that's underestimated by the anglers. Um, yeah, we like to, we like to joke around with our trout hatchery guys and tell them that the anglers fish for our fish the other 360 days a year. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, even further on that point, you know, I get a lot of questions, especially a good example is the channel catfish. You know, like when I tell people, visitors that we raise channel catfish, they look at me like, aren't those everywhere? Why would you have to raise those? Well, come to find out, you know, they're, they're not everywhere. You know, they're, they've always been in the rivers. They're indigenous to Pennsylvania, but as late as 1985, there was only one reproducing inland lake, which was Pyramid Tuning. All the other lakes did not have reproducing channel mm -hmm. catfish. Yeah. So all through the, you know, the 70s and 80s, we were getting fish from other states and stocking channel catfish, and a lot of those didn't take off, you know. So we just kept at it, kept raising bigger fish, and now we have somewhere between 30 and 50 lakes that have natural reproduction. They're currently assessing that. You know, and then we were doing other cool things. You know, once we get a lake established and they start reproducing on their own, then we can put those resources towards establishing a population somewhere else. It's a great fish to get people started fishing on. They taste good. They fight hard. Kids can catch them. You know, it's an exciting thing to create out there. You know, and then our yeah. habitat our habitat guys get involved because they're out there building spawning boxes and some of these lakes where they're not having good reproduction. They're putting spawning habitat out there working with us. You know, and as we get an established population in that lake, we move on to stock them somewhere else. And then on top of all that, we got fin, t fin clip studies determining which water bodies, what prey predator um, populations work best with fingerlings that we've always stocked. And now we're also, we're raising yearlings. So we're raising these things up to, you know, eight, 10, 12 inches and putting those in the lakes where the fingerlings didn't work and finding success establishing populations that way. So, you know, it's always been one of my dreams and they, you started to see this before the COVID stuff happened was we were starting to have um, channel catfish instructional events where we'd get, mm -hmm. you know, 200 people from the public. We'd teach them how to fish for them, how to catch them. We'd stock a bunch of fish in a small area so they could catch them and have success. And then uh, well, you could point down the road and say, oh, by the way, everything you learned here today, you can, you can do it this lake over here and this lake yeah. over here. And, you know, it's what a, what a great way to grow the sport, you know, and Absolutely. if we look at every species that way, instead of just, just putting things out without thinking about it. If we look at it as growing a sport, you know, there's things we can do to make it work better. <laughs> so on that, um, kind of two things there. One, what change that created from like to go the yearlings, even like the catfish, has this just been something that they found out with like from like the muskies and things like that, where holding these fish longer and then stocking them again just gives them flat out a better chance? Or was that just kind of just an overall assumption or did they do individual studies on the species there? And two, yeah. um, uh, the, the catfish, at least when they're smaller, they seem to be a huge 
forage in general for most predators. I mean, bass, large crappie, um, muskie, and even other catfish. So, I mean, that, that can't, stalking those things can't even hurt in that regard. You're helping all the bigger stuff get even bigger. Right. Yeah, so it, it's kind of both. So the, for, for decades, the warm water stocking philosophy was a numbers game. So, you know, and that's another reason why the warm water hatcheries, I feel like, never got a good, um, a lot of good recognition because it, it's hard to prove what you're doing. You know, it's when you're just introducing somebody to it. So if we go to a lake and we put six million wa walleye fry that are only three days old and just a little wiggle, someone rolls their eyes and goes, oh, most of those are going to eat. Yes, but that we, we anticipate that, you know what I mean? So when our biologists go out and they do, they assess a lake, they assess a walleye population based on how many acres that lake is, they can determine, okay, we need to boost this population. So if they want 6,000 extra walleyes into that population, we can do that in several ways. We could raise a bunch of 14, 16 inch walleyes. That's gonna cost millions of dollars to stock 8,000 of them so that 6,000 of them live. Or we can put 6 million walleye fry in and get the same res result. 99.9% .9 of them die, but the 6,000 that we wanted that population to go up by is what lived. And then we can test the make sure that's working by marking the fish. So that's where we, where we, in this, I started with walleye because that's what we've been doing for a long time. We use a chemical that marks their cartilage and then it puts a little yellow ring on it. So then we, later we go out in the young, in the fall, we catch what we call young of the year. So they're about eight, nine inches long or whatever lived from the spring spawn and stockings. So we bring those in, we pull the ear bones out, we grind them down, and we look to see if that little yellow ring is in there, then we know if they came from our stockings or not. So that's kind of the basis for the whole science is we're, we're stocking lots of small fish, but we're also backing it up with science to make sure we're getting the results that we want. So that was always the, the plan. Same thing with the channel catfish was um, we, if we wanted to to raise the channel catfish population somewhere, it was kind of a dollars and cents thing too. You know, it's cost a lot less money to raise whole bunches of small ones than it does to raise a few big ones. So we knew we could get the same result both ways, um, but it's cheaper to go with the with the numbers. Now, I that think was, that's a, yeah, that's a go ahead. That, I mean, that was a theory, and that's a good theory, and it works. The problem is. Um, when we started looking at ways to increase license sales, which we want to make anglers be excited to go fishing, not just know there's some channel catfish in a lake. We want them to go to a place called, hey, we're going to catch fish all evening. Let's bring as many people as we can because this is going to be a lot of fun. If we want to create that kind of fishery, we got to look at what what's holding us back from that. What's the stuff about survivability? And, you know, just common sense tells you larger fish are going to survive better. Um, also, it looks better. You know, we feel like we're putting out a better product to raise a bigger fish. It's healthier. It's got some fat. It's going to be able to withstand the winter, the first winter that it goes through a little better. So there's a lot of things that make sense about stocking larger fish, but we have to take the money issue into account too. So we got to put the larger fish where they're needed and the smaller fish where they already have been proven to work. Um, so that it all, all those species, you know, the walleyes, um, the channel catfish and the muskies, it all kind of developed at the same time. And it was out of a desire to control the survivability a little bit more so that we can make, know that we're creating an improved fishery rather than creating just a bunch of opportunities that we weren't exactly sure how it was going to work. Does that make sense? Yeah, that to me, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I think that that's interesting because, you know, some of this stuff always comes back to dollars and cents, you know, and I, I feel like it, that's a, that's a great point to bring up that you guys look at that and really you're adjusting based off of what, you know, what it takes, I would guess, financially to be able to stock these fish and then just adjust based off of, you know, based, based off of science, really like, you know, different methodologies. And, and I think some people, again, I just don't understand. I don't think that people understand what it takes to do what you guys do, you know, and that's that dollars and cents thing is, I think that hits home with people when you start attaching a dollar amount on some of this, it really makes people think about what's all involved in that. You know, I, I can remember standing in the hatchery and you showing us you know, the walleye pits and saying there's 1.7 million walleye in that tank. And I'm just looking at these little, 
walleye fry, like, like unbelievable in my mind, but you know, then you think about what it takes to actually get those fish out, you know, put them in and, and what they are, you know, years later, you know, when they're being caught. And they um, end up with a dinner plate. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, yeah. I mean, that's, I don't know. There's just a lot there. And I, I just think that when you attach the, the, the dollars and cents to it, that makes it, I think, more real to people to see what it takes, you know, to do this. Yeah, and it's definitely something we considered with the, the Muskie program, you know, was, when we started talking about going to the yearly program, um, it was certainly not a program that we we're looking to increase the money we spent on it because we already, you know, we always heard the comments in the, you know, the back of the room saying how much money the Muskie program costs. And that wasn't something we were trying to shine a light on. We didn't want um, anybody that's not a muskie fisherman to feel like we're spending more money than we should on them. But we certainly didn't want the muskie anglers to feel like we were taking anything away from them because we we're stocking less fish. So the number that we decided on, you know, that's 0.75 fish per acre, what came from literature and other states, what they were doing with having success, success with um, stocking yearling muskies. And then we figured out how many fish we could raise on our raceways at Linesville. And uh, it worked out to where we thought we could raise the exact or raise less fish, raise them to the yearling size, but spend the exact same amount of money as we were stocking the, the smaller um, fall fingerlings. And that way, you know, nobody nobody had a gripe. You know what I mean? The, the musky fishermen felt like we're still spending the same amount of money on them. And nobody, everybody else that feels like they're not interested in musky, muskies, we're not taking any more of their money away from them. So everybody wins. So, you know, th- Sometimes we think about dollars and cents that way. It's, it's kind of playing the game on make how you make our the, the program valuable and make it speak for itself. And now, now with musky anglers and people just going crazy on social media about how much success they're having, now we're starting to hear the people, you know, in upper reaches of our agency, mentioning just in side conversations about how exciting the musky program is, and that's really cool. Yeah, and I, I think that's a huge deal because I I don't know. I'm not I'm not involved in that aspect of it, but I I kind of understand how sometimes how hard it is to get that the importance of certain things up the ladder. You know, and I, I just think hearing that, that's kind of that's kind of a big deal when you start getting upper echelon, I guess, I don't know, for lack of a better term, staff members talking about the program like that. You know, that's a that's a big deal. Um, something that's been, you know, a long time coming too, right, Jared? Like this isn't just, I think people see that, you know, the, the rebranding of muskies being stocked at a bigger size and think that this is kind of like, you know, it's something that's happened in the last three years, but it really <laughs> isn't. I mean, this was, the seed had been planted a, a long time ago. And because of that upper, you know, the upper management and the agency and needing to, you know, kind of reevaluate what was going on and, you know, the whole legislative side of it that has to be passed through the board and you know, have to have a lot of people actually approve, you know, the next, you know, whatever the management plans and everything like that that went along with it. And, uh, you know, just a ton of work by everybody involved to get everything to where it is now. And, um, you know, it's really good to hear that there's people that are noticing those things because, you know, for a long time, we felt like, like everything was just trout, trout, trout. And, right. you know, it wasn't like, you know, you think, geez, this is a native species of Pennsylvania in the Ohio River watershed. And, you know, these fish should be here just as much as a trout should, right? Right, so, right, and, absolutely. And I think it's really great to hear that it's coming, you know, to that point. Yeah, and I think... So you know, I think social media sites have helped a lot with that. You know, yeah. when I watch the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission Facebook page, you know, I try to pay attention to what what posts are getting a lot of likes and which posts are getting a lot of comments. And, you know, sometimes you can scroll through there and you find a musky post or a walleye post or a channel catfish post. And those things just blow up. They go nuts. You know, I was watching. I don't know if you guys got to see any of the, the outdoor expo. Um, I watched stuff the comments. Yeah, and they, I was watching the comments in there, and you know, the comments popping up were all warm water fish related. You know that that's exciting to me, and I think people are starting to notice that. And I think that's an avenue that before social media, there wasn't a really good 
good way to measure that kind of interest. You know what I mean? It's just if we focused on trout and all our literature was about trout, then all the people we heard from were about trout. You know what I mean? So there was no way for people that cared about walleyes and channel catfish and stuff to, to get their voices in there. Um, but now with social media, you see which questions pop up and you see which posts get likes and you can kind of judge what your, your licensed buyer base is interested in. So I have a question too um, that uh, I've had a lot of conversation with Brian and Ensign, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the things that we've heard back from Brian, I've shared some data with him from the the angler log that we put together, um, yep. and then also through the Muskie Zinc uh, logs that we get for the yearly fish counts and things like that. And uh, it was interesting. He told me that he was seeing a lot more of those, like the 25 to 28 inch fish this year when they did any type of survey that they did any time on the water that they had spent. And that was really cool to hear that because, it, you know, coming from a guy that's on the water all the time, you know, that made me feel good. And, you know, made it obviously to, for him to mention it made him feel good too. So. Yeah. And, you know, Brian's a musky guy, but I'm hearing that from everybody, you know, yeah. there's biologists out on, out on the rivers doing walleye surveys and they'll, they'll call me the next day and be like jared you wouldn't believe how many yearly muskies we saw while we were cruising <laughs> down through this river or you know, raised down lake i've yeah. you know if you follow their facebook page there's been Tons more people in there posting i caught my first muskie ever you know Tons it's of tigers this year off that page yeah, yeah. hey but I, I had a question kind of about um how you got into that whatever started the or if you were even around when the the start of the, the pro thought process of going to the the year the whole year fish versus the fall fingerlings, how did that conversation ever come about? Was that just an internal thing, or was that something that the commission took from like comments from like clubs like Muskies Inc. or th other other organizations or anything like that? You know, it was it was kind of strange how it came about. It it kind of popped up out of nowhere after, you know, it's always been brought up. It's always been talked about. You know, um, all the clubs for years talked about stocking larger fish. Um, and it's something that would get talked about in a meeting, but then it never would go anywhere. And then I really think what happened was um, it came out of brainstorming sessions because license sales were going down so far. Once license sales started going down and we started having more meetings that were focused around how do we sell more licenses, it just kept coming up and coming up and coming up that the only way that people are going to buy more fishing licenses is if they have more success fishing. And then you started hearing that word destination waters here and there, you know, and that, every time I heard one of the, you know, especially one of the guys in the upper echelon say something about a destination water, I got really excited because I could tell that kind of mindset was starting to starting to sink in. And that's what we always wanted was we wanted to stop sprinkling fish out quite so much and try to concentrate them to where they'll work and they'll make something exciting. And I think, you know, Brian Enzyme got put in charge of, or, you know, Brian Enzyme's boss was put in charge of, um, writing the new musky management plan. So Brian was always, you know, instrumental in talking with the clubs and me and Brian came up through the system together. We started our careers off together at the Union City Hatchery, learning how to feed convert muskies. And uh, so his heart's always been in this program. And I think he had a lot of influence on that beginning stages of that musky plan. And I think at the same time that the upper people were starting to think destination waters and the musky clubs are starting to say or continue to say we need bigger fish. It just, it just went on like a light bulb. Everyone, nobody really said it. I don't think it was anybody's particular idea. I think everybody just, it just flipped the switch and said, you know, what we need to do is start raising bigger muskies and make this thing really exciting. Plus, you know, Brian Enzyme's study on that, you know, his coded wire tag study on the fall versus spring, uh, success of those fish and the stockings, you know, really, really put the nail in the coffin because um, after three or four years of doing it, we're definitely finding, you know, three to one better survival on the spring fish. It just makes more sense, you know, despite their larger size, which is great, just a better time of year to stock the fish when mm -hmm. everything else out there is spawning and there's lots for them to eat rather than sticking them out right before winter and letting them kind of starve to death for a few months and hope they do okay in the spring. Um, so it just all fell into place, and uh, I'm, I couldn't be happier with how it worked out. 
Well, Destination Waters is neat because there were a bunch of people that we talked to that were like, don't see the need to drive to Chautauqua. <laughs> right. For, well, I drive past some of those PA lakes and go fish Chautauqua now. And it, it's, it's that almost serious. brings a tear to my eye. That's what I want to hear. Yeah. I mean, that's serious conversations out there. Like, <laughs> that's big time to me. That's huge. Yeah. Wow. That, <clears throat> I, I mean, I experienced that last year. You know, I, there's no reason for me to go to New York last year. I mean, we still went. Maybe I think I was up there twice, but I spent more time in PA last year than I did probably the last two years before that, you know, it's Jared, it was awesome. You know, it was awesome uh, to be able to fish. I when you got, you kind of got, I've kind of been with you since you started getting into musky fishing and yeah. I'll tell you what, I, your picture was popping up with a new musky on your, in your lap every few days this year. Well, you must have had a heck of a year. That's uh, what I, I fish a lot with the two guys that are on with us. So, yeah, you know, yeah. ride, riding coattails. You know, Charlie and Evan and yeah. Tony Slink. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. You, you, you hooked up with some good guys there, but um, look like you had a heck of a year. Yeah, I uh, I would have loved to fish more and catch more fish, but you know, <laughs> I didn't I didn't get out Everybody. as much as it, <laughs> exactly. I didn't get out as much as I would have liked to, but it was it was uh, it was by far my best musky season ever, and I, you know, I can't I can't ask for better opportunities than I had. I mean, even. If I told you how many fish I hooked and lost last year from shore, you'd be sick. Like it was ridiculous. And part of that is me being inexperienced, you know, uh, that these guys will tell you, like, I, I mean, I've made, I probably made every mistake there is to make as a musky angler and then some, but the well, thing is you got to keep learning. Right. So I want to, I want to go back for a minute. Ev, Evan, you touched on, we'll say the software that you guys put together or the site that you put together. Can we just talk about that for a minute? Just maybe highlight what you have out there for, you know, the catches and things like that, the recording of, yeah, I just want to just touch on it. It was kind of like one of those things that we had seen that the Ohio program had put together uh, an angler log. And I remember from, um, you know, going back to one of the meetings that I had gone to with the Fish and Boat Commission on the musky management plan when it had first come out. Um, out in North Park, they had everybody come out, and uh, they had the the uh, yellow back paper log books that they were passing out to people. And uh, it's just one of those things where you know, in in a, a fishing uh, type of fishing like muskies, that we could just see that there was not a whole lot of information sharing. And and I think that that was a crucial part of biologists having the information that they needed to to put the fish in the right places or you know, to just see where people were focusing and maybe, you know, focus on the same places. Um, so that was just a, um, at the time I did a lot of GIS work. So it was just an ARC GIS program uh, with a database attached to it that just collected angler log data. Uh, people could get onto that site and, you know, put in the information. We worked with the Fish and Boat Commission biologists, um, I can't remember exactly who it was right now, but we got a lot of the data that they wanted. A lot of it was like the catch per unit effort kind of stuff with, you know, the hours invested and the number of trips that people made and, and um, you know, when they contacted fish or, you know, when they caught fish. So, um, and then really got a lot of positive feedback from Brian Ensign and, and uh, the biologists of Fish and Boat Commission because, they used that information and they shared it at their annual meetings and, and, you know, actually got some good feedback from some of the other people about what they were hearing from people, you know, getting good results from the, the program. So it was, uh, it was good to hear. It was nice that people were actually logging fish and, you know, giving us some useful information to share. So um, I think one of the things too, Jared, that you mentioned that we kind of just glazed over was the feed conversion of muskies. And I know that was one thing that was just another huge, like a milestone, you know, it's like they go from dry food to be able to get these fish to eat, you know, minnows or have like the, the musky chapters put money towards minnows and have, you know, fish converted and be able to you know, get right into water and be able to eat what's there and not, you know, I don't know what the whole, you know, were they looking for pellets when they were there or just, you know, not able to, know what to eat once they got there but 
it was just another big step, I feel, in the muskie program. I agree. I mean, um, these the fish we're putting out now, I mean, the, those minnows, they add, not only they get their instincts to feed going, it gives them such an immune system boost, you know, so they're going to these other waters. It's The stocking event in itself is obviously a stressful thing on these fish. And anytime these fish feel stressed, they're open to diseases. So those, having that boost of minnows in there absolutely has to expand their survival tenfold. And it's so great that we have that communication with the musky clubs and everybody feels like they're a part of it. It's, you know, I think we're really seeing something special in the, the population of muskies in Pennsylvania and everybody has a piece of it. So it's really cool. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask actually, directed to Evan on about that musky angler log, the the non muskies ink one. So just in general, for I know there's still a lot of guys that don't like to share information or talk about whatever. So does any of that information get shared with anybody aside from the commission in that program? Uh, the information is just logged straight into a database and that goes straight from you know I download the data and just share it straight to Brian Ensign. So it really doesn't get put out to anybody. I mean, it's not, um, you know, there's, there's honestly nothing to be worried about. I know that in the, in the musky angler log, you, you have to put a dot on the map and that's just kind of the mapping, um, the mapping capabilities with it. And it's just, it's not, it's, it's really more of the database side that's important and not the dot on the map. So you could put the dot anywhere you want and it doesn't even have to be on the body of water. Um, Aside from the fact that the Fish and Boat Commission does want to know some of that information as to where you actually caught your fish, because they like to know, um, you know, where they're putting fish and, and what they're getting back. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty much you know ninety nine point nine percent private, and you know I'm not looking to gain information from it by any means. Um, so. It's great that uh, we we have something like that for them to to get information. That's a that's a great point, Charlie, that you guys brought up there, because that right there to me eliminates every excuse that somebody could have not to share that information because it's not public. You know, nobody's going to use that to spot burn or anything else, and all of that <laughs> you know I'm going to mention spot burn, but like that information is going to help the fishery and, and to help Jared and, and, you know, biologists and things. I mean, that, that's a huge toll, man. I really, I think that's a, that's something that, I don't know, I don't want to use the term push harder, but, you know, I just, myself included, I, I just think we need to use it more, you know, it's, it, it's it awesome. should be. Yeah. Because I mean, you or I can't see what Evan put in, you or I right. can't see what Jared put in. And for guys that are still super secretive about everything, I mean, it's it it helps you, and it still keeps it secret, so to speak. I think it's one of those things you gotta almost train people. You know, I mean, one of the, I mean, I, I yeah. stink at it too. To be honest, I mean, I made the thing, okay. and I really had a hard time logging my own fish. But I think a lot of it has to do with getting yourself into a pattern. You know, you, you spend a day on the water, you come back and you write your information down in a logbook or something like that. And you make sure the next step is to log that information onto the, the page for the Muskie Angle Log for Pennsylvania. And then, you know, at the end of the year, you have everything that you need. But I think a lot of it is just to get people down into a, a routine and, and have that set up for, you know, ready to go. But We'll, we'll have to push it more 2021. I agree. So I, there's yeah. something else I want to jump to, unless you guys have something else to hit on there. We were, we were talking about financial, you know, attaching, I guess, financial numbers to, you know, fish and how all of this stuff works and getting people's attention. One, one of the things that I have on my list to talk about tonight is right here, voluntary permits. Jared, I, you know, I've got a question on the musky voluntary permit. I'm sure we all do at least have one question, but in general, you know, I still feel like there's a lot of people out there that aren't understanding what, or even know that these permits exist. And I feel like, Charlie, you brought this up in one of the last conversations we had, regardless of what permit 
you support and you put your money into, it's ultimately helping the fishery no matter what. As far as these permits go, can you give us any information, you know, on what permits are available and maybe how they would help the hatcheries, if that's fair? Yeah, you know, um, I know everything there is to know about the muskie permit. The other ones I'm not as versed as I should be. You know, I know there's some really nice handouts on our website that explain them all really well. You know, the, the conservation and habitat one I know sells very, very well. Um, I think everybody's been shocked at how well the bass um, permit sells. You know, a lot of that money, we're using some of that money at hatcheries. We're looking at raising some advanced largemouth bass, you know, for for waters that we really want to push the population where we want. There's some waters where we're trying to stock largemouth bass just to see if they'll control the gizzard shad population. Because, you know, there's a lot of lakes across the state where the gizzard shad population is exploding so much that it makes, it makes fishing difficult for everything because the fish just aren't hungry. Um, so we're trying things like that. But a lot of that bass money goes into habitat. You know, that, you know, we're not even been, you know, a lot of what we do at the hatcheries for bass is restoring populations, especially after a dam is refilled. Restoring that bass population is the number one priority because they keep everything else in balance. So if they keep the panfish and the, the forage fish in balance, then everything else in the lake will fall into place. But if you don't have enough bass in there at the beginning, then you end up with stunted panfish and it just, it's a, it's a, you're fighting a losing battle trying to get the, the fishery to be excellent if you don't get that bass population right. So we raise a lot of largemouth bass and it's for that purpose. Um, but the limiting factor in the wild for largemouth bass, the reason we don't stock them all over the place is that they, they reproduce on their own very, very well. You know, they, they make a nest, they clean their eggs, they defend their young. The, the limiting factor is, you know, the, the quarter inch guys getting those to live past all the bluegills in the lake. You know what I mean? And and it's supposed to be that way. A lake will balance itself out and enough enough predators will live to keep the keep everything in balance. Um, so the limiting factor in a lot of these places is spawning habitat. So that's where a lot of the large mouth bass money goes is to creating more spawning habitat and structure and stuff where these fish can have even more success in their spawning. Um, obviously the, the, the wild trout and those permits are doing really, really well and going towards access and cleaning up waterways and making veg riparian vegetative buffers around these waters to keep them cool and protect them. Um, doing additional class A surveys, looking for trout all over the place, you know, that, that all costs money. And then a lot of times there's just not enough time or money to do it. So a lot of that goes to that. But, you know, and I've talked to you guys for years about the muskie permit, where I wasn't even excited about the the money aspect of it. I was excited because I saw it as like a, a chance for anglers to vote for how important the muskie species was to them. And boy, did people answer this year. You know, that first year we got we got $16,000 from it. And this sec, this the second year we doubled that. We got $32,000. Wow. wow. That's incredible. I, I couldn't be happier. And and I agree with you. I still think, I, I hear from people all the time still that have never even heard of it. They don't even know what it is. You know, and if you buy your license online, it kind of pops up and is in your face. You got to click a button to say, no, I don't want that. But everybody buying their license in a store, I bought my license at Field and Stream here, you know, a month ago. And I asked the girl for the voluntary muskie permit. And she, she didn't even know what it was. So not only are they not offering it to people, she didn't, nobody, nah. up to that point, nobody had asked her about it. You know what I mean? So there's some problems with the program, but obviously for programs like yours and everybody else, you know, we're getting the word out there because that, that muskie stamp really, it really sold good this year. And I think that has a lot to do with the things I'm hearing within the Fish and Boat Commission about people recognizing how popular the program is. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, man. Words cannot describe that because that's one of those things where it's like a, a lot of your diehard, true diehard guys probably most likely at some point in their life have been members of Muskie Inc. and know how to help via that way. But people that are like go fishing and maybe they see a muskie once or twice a season as like a bycatch or whatever, and they're like, I'd like a better chance of catching this fish. That's the way to help. They can help themselves. Because maybe they're not just wanting to go out and chase muskies like us maniacs, for lack of a better way to put it, every, every time we go out. 
Um, they actually like to catch fish consistently. And, but that's even helping that because I mean, it, it's getting to the point where, like you said, you can pretty much count on at least one fish a day in most cases now. That's right. Yeah. I mean, so my other, I guess my other question with the permit, you know, I think, I don't think it was last year, the year before, was it the year before that we were able to, you guys were able to do the heaters to manage the water temps? Yeah, that was last year. That was the first year. Okay, that was the first year last year. I don't know why I was thinking that was from the year before, but. Did you guys get that done? Did that help yep. out? Well, this will be, it got installed um, about two months ago. And so we've gone through a lot of testing. It's working great. And so this upcoming uh, spawn in, in April, when we start collecting musky eggs, will be the first time we put it to use for the muskies. And it's really going to make a difference. I want to see two extra inches, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys can do it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's awesome, though. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, people need to know is like that money goes to the program and right. it's going to help you do what you need to do more effectively. And it's going to help us catch fish, even bigger, like, fish. even bigger fish. Like this is, I don't know, man, that's just, that's, that's really cool. So yeah, that's the biggest part of that story to make sure we keep telling people is, you know, the, the only feedback we got pre uh, putting this thing into place was that people weren't sure the money was really going to go to where it was supposed to. And I mean, I think we've proven now that, for every one of those permits, they go to a special account and it only gets used for what it's supposed to get used for. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I, I read that a lot initially and I, I'm, I don't know, I'm not, I usually do my re I do my research before I jump on board, but I mean, that was kind of the thing with the permit is like, I talked to you, I talked to other people, you know, I was reading a ton. I mean, I just, I probably read more and analyze more than I should, but like pretty instantly I, I knew that this was going to, you know, go to a good cause. And I, I think most people, if they would spend the time, they would realize that quick. And I mean, that's just, that's such an awesome way to show that. I think one of the things with that is it literally gives people the ability to say, Hey, I want my money to go to here versus just your license sales. Just go here. Say, Hey, I want to see better conservation for, or for land management and things like that. And it's just, they can see, they literally get to see the result where like their license fee, they might say somebody doesn't even fish for trout. They might be a bass guy and they're like, what does it have any effect on what I fish for this way? That little permit that they have gives them direct results, makes them feel better about where their money's going. Absolutely involved with like the lake erie permit that had anything to do with these musky permits because i mean that was a big thing back charlie and i had to talk about the steelhead program i went to school at penn state Barron back in the early 2000s so i kind of fished it whenever it was at its peak and you know it was amazing what the, the lake erie permit did to gain anglers access to you know some of that body of water was just getting posted faster than it was you know able to, to get on it and um it, it was just kind of interesting how that you know it it seems like these permits are kind of mirroring what happened with that where you know guys say hey you know i'm really die hard about this i'd like to invest some money in this and and it's nice to see that you know like you said everything's going back into it and you know we're seeing good results for these individual programs based on exactly what you know the fish and boat commission said that they were going to do so it's uh it's been great yeah it's it's an interesting comparison you know i don't i don't think there was a whole lot of thought comparing them at the time but it, it really lines up well when you look back on it yeah. um just because of that i think i think it's i think it's worked better than anybody thought it was going to to be honest um right. i think i think initially it was just an idea while we were, because the legislature has to approve so many things that we do. Um, there's not only so many ways we can raise revenue and we were, we were having trouble keeping the lights on, to be honest, you know what I mean? Like we we're getting nervous and, um, yeah. and we can't create a special license or a special this or a special that without legislature approval, but and just a permit that people could just donate money to was something we could do on our own because it's not, 
it doesn't we're not requiring anything of the legislature's constituents you know what i mean we're just putting it out there as an option and people took off with it you know and it was great you know i think it, the response has been great and i think the, it's a feel-good story because i think within the fish and boat commission um they see how excited anglers are to to put their money where in in, in the areas that they care about um and it makes us feel good that we're doing stuff that they you know it, you know, so you're not sitting here brainstorming in a meeting about 10 different ways to improve bass habitat and wondering if anybody really cares. Now you have direct people voting and putting in their, their two cents to say, I care about this a lot and I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. And it's, it makes, I think it gives enthusiasm, I guess is what I'm trying to say is, you know, that way when the biologists sit down and talk about bass habitat this spring, they're gonna say, listen guys, everybody's excited about this. What are we gonna do? You know, it just brings a whole, whole nother level to the excitement. Yeah. One of, the things, one of the programs that you guys had was the best fishing waters, and they kind of seems to line up along with what you were talking about, with just trying to get people excited about catching better and bigger fish and knowing where to go and kind of shortening the curve for, for people. And Did that ever seem to take off, or was this kind of like the home run that you guys had hit, you know? Yeah, this was definitely the home run. Um, you still hear people reference the best fishing waters. I think that program needs a little tweaking still. You know, I was, yeah. I was talking to one of the biologists the other day about why this lake was on this list and not on this list. And they're kind of going by um, biologist trap net data when they do their surveys is what they're, yeah. they're using as that, that measure. But sometimes biologists don't get around all the lakes. And, um, you know, and then some biologists, you know, they put their own waters on there or not put their own waters on there. And some of them are using whether there's good access for the public or not, you know, as criteria. So it's not just based on the population of the fish. It's how easy they are to go there and fish for that kind of thing. So everybody's using a little bit of different criteria, I think. So that could still use a little tweaking, but the idea is sound. And you're certainly not going to find a water on there that says this is a one of the best channel catfish waters in the state and go there and not expect to catch fish. So, I mean, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. That's a good point, Evan. Thanks for bringing that up. I was, I was, I've been thinking about that, you know, the best waters I've used that a good bit, but I did notice there is a, there is one musky lake missing from that list that probably <laughs> should be on there that might be okay that it's left off at this point. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so I have another question about, I guess this is the muskie permit. So what, you know, I guess for the muskie program, what do you guys have anything in mind for your next project? Like what, uh, you know, what's out there for, for the muskie stocking program? Any new updates? Well, um, well, as far as the stocking program itself, it's kind of, um, we're not making too many big changes right now. Um, last year we added two sections of Bald Eagle Creek below Sayers Reservoir. Um, that was something that came from the Nittany Valley guys. Um, talked about it with the biologists. And apparently they saw good value in doing that. So that's something that got added. And that's always something we're looking for is, um, and especially in that center county area. You know, it's that's something that's kind of one of my goals for walleyes or muskies or anything is that center of the state is just, it is so trout heavy and there's not a lot of great waters, you know. So when I hear about when the Nittany Valley guys started talking about Bald Eagle Creek having um, good habitat and stuff. And um, it just made sense to get an extra, a good water body in that area. Um, but we do have some, um, we're just fine tuning our, fine tuning our methods. We had a lot of, um, this is our second year in a row using uh, the snap feeders I was telling you about last year. It's something we just kind of experimented with that, it's in the hatch house, we're using snap feeders that spread the feed out more during the early parts of feed conversion, rather than using those the small round feeders that only drop feed in one spot. So that's making a really big uh, difference for us, but they're very expensive, we need some more of them. Um, as far as this year's musky stamp money, that hasn't been fully approved yet. I was hoping to get it done before here, but I also did kind of promise the Fat AZ guys I'd drop the, drop the bomb for them on their podcast. There you go. <laughs> Uh, but I, they haven't approved, you know, what we wrote up, but uh, we have a, a proposal in for how to spend the $32,000, the best benefit of the Muskie program as we see it right now. Um, and we think it's going to help a lot. So we're heading in the right direction, um, you know, and, you know, bigger musky yearlings. Um, these fish have been bigger than 
you know, at least meeting our expectations for the last couple of years when we were doing this. But it's not out of the realm of possibilities to get, you know, an average that's two inches bigger. Because by the time we're done stocking, you know, we've told everybody that we're shooting for that target range of 12 to 14 inches. So the last couple of springs have been so cold. I mean, it was snowing almost to the end of April last year. So, you know, we come out of winter with a 10, 10 and a half inch fish. We got to get a couple of inches on this thing just to get it to our bottom line of where we told people we're not stocking them any smaller than this. And when we only have a month and a half to do that, you know, I'll sweat and bullets a little bit. But and then the we'll pressure you guys all had from the, the changes this past year What's that for the pressure that you guys all had from the oh, yeah. way of what happened this last year yeah, to COVID stuff. make it easier <laughs> yeah we were sending two or three guys out trout stocking all spring long from our hatchery you know so we were just it was all hands on deck trying to get get everything done because you know if we would have said hey we we don't have enough help to try we don't have enough people to help with trout stocking. We have to get our eggs. They would have told us not to get our eggs because trout stocking was the thing. So we had to know in the back of our minds, complaining is not an option. We're going to send guys to help trout stock and we're going to get our jobs done. And uh, it was a lot of long days and it was a lot of hard work, but we got it done. Yeah, you guys did it for PA and Ohio. You said Yeah, Ohio. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's that was part of the, uh, those Ohio fish was just part of um, the success of those snap feeders I was talking about. You know, we didn't take, we took about the same amount of eggs as we always do. We had an exceptionally good survival in the early stages um, because of those snap feeders are were able to distribute the feed a little bit more accurately. And we've yeah. played with them in the past, but they're really sensitive. You know, they, it takes a long time to, it's just little nuts and bolts yeah. trying to get the, the place to slide right to get to the right amount of feed to drop that you want. And if you get too much, your tank's going to get dirty, your fish are going to get sick. So it takes a long time to get them adjusted perfect. Um, and back in the old days, it just wasn't worth it. But now, in the absence of the snap feeders, we got three guys down there throwing little pinches of food for eight hours a day. You know what I mean? That takes a long time. So in comparison to that, taking 20 minutes to adjust a feeder is no big deal. So our perspective has changed a little bit and uh, they're working pretty good. So we had such a good survival that when Ohio called and said, Hey, we couldn't get any eggs. You got any fish for us. Like, yeah, we got plenty. <laughs> so what might happen in years if that same thing happens, but obviously hopefully nothing else happens like it did last year, but you still have that excess amount of fish. I mean, is that something that you guys would like trade with another state again to get, a different kind of fish, like say stripers or something like that, because I know you guys don't raise stripers anymore. Yeah, all the neighboring states know that um, we're always open for taking wipers and stripers, and we're always in the market for, um, we've been trading with New Jersey to get northern pike. You know, northern pike isn't something that's hard for us to raise. We only stock them in a couple lakes, but their New Jersey starts spawning like a month before we do. So we might as well take their extra northern pike that are four inches by the time we would even take eggs. Um, easy, easy, and then man. we did the same thing. We supplied all, all of New Jersey's muskies last year, too. Um, so we have a good working relationship with them. Um, and then if nobody wants them, then we'll, we'll stock them as small fingerlings, um, which won't have a great survival rate, but they're going to add something. You know what I mean? And usually we'll stock them in big numbers. So like we gave Ohio 40,000 fish this year. And we could have stuck that whole 40,000 in Kinzu Reservoir and maybe... 400 to 4,000 would have lived, who knows? But you know what I mean? It's um, it's gonna be something. And we'll put them in those waters that are, you know, needing an extra boost. So um, we feel like if we put big numbers of something in there and they happen to survive good, we're not gonna hurt the water. Um, but um, putting big numbers in there has a chance to help bring it back around. So, you know, with last year, you guys couldn't really get any outside help with stocking and things like that. I know when I was up and we, we did Conneaut that day. You know, there was a couple guys there that, that helped you guys. And I, I guess it seems like that part of it, just getting anglers in general to be able to volunteer to help would be take some of the burden off you guys. So how, I mean, how much, how much harder was that for you guys? Not, I guess not that it's, it, it makes a huge dent, but how much harder was that for you guys dealing with the COVID scenario last year and having to stock, everything you know do do everything you know it was definitely it was definitely a challenge and it is it's nice having the anglers there um i really like having the ability to to net a lot of the fish off and having you know some of the muskies 
musky guys there to help net those fish off and get them in the water nice and easy. Um, I really like that aspect of it. Um, we didn't see any detrimental. We ended up having to tube all the fish um, because a lot of the trips our drivers were by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I asked every driver when they came back and they actually seemed to swim off better than I thought they would. You know, a lot of times, even when we set them in nice and easy with the net, they will end up with a few hundred left. You know what I mean? They're just kind of hanging out. It looks like every fish on the truck is there. But then when you think about how many we just stuck in there and how many you can count, it's not that many, but it just looks odd, you know, but last year with tubing them, they actually swam off pretty good, which I was good to hear. So um, I don't think there's any detriment to the fish. Yeah, but, I, saw, I saw some of the video that Donnie, actually Donnie Swink did. Um, he just and it, stumbled on that. I yeah. you, that wasn't planned at all. We were not allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah. He just happened to be there when the truck pulled up, which was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. He t he, I remember him telling me, but the footage he had, the fish did. I mean, they swam off perfectly fine from, you know, what you could tell from the video. I, I just thought, I thought that was kind of cool because, you know, that was just one of those happenstance things where he, he was just there and took, you know, took some video. Right. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. you know, we stocked just under 12,000 pounds of muskies last year. And that, that's just unbelievable from where we came from, you know, back in 2004, 2006, all the way up to 2008, we were stocking like 4,000 pounds a year, you know, and those are just those little, little guys, you know, and we were stocking a lot of them. We were really proud of what we were doing. Because we had, you know, just mastered the feed conversion process to build a to raise 120,000 fish for $10,000 worth of dry food. You know, no other state was doing that, so we were excited about it. But then you look where we're at now, and it's, you know, we're just tickled. We're over the moon happy with how the program's working. 115 bodies of water, or something like that, at that time too, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, I, I have a question. Um, this can be for Charlie and, and for Evan. And I'm sure, Jared, you're probably aware of some of this, but just out of curiosity for you guys, what what was the biggest fish you guys caught in PA last year as far as a muskie goes? Go first, Evan. I don't have to answer that question because I didn't catch any muskies in PA last year. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, I <laughs> Last year, I think it was 43 and a half inches. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a great year for me, but I did catch uh, probably the most muskies I've ever caught. And the majority of them came from Pennsylvania. I want to say um, maybe 15 of them came from out of state. Um, so, you know, I had a, a great year in Pennsylvania. Not, you know, not any giant fish, but um, I got to net one. So, Charlie, you can talk about yours. <laughs> Well, for Evans, one should have been over 44. That was the biggest male I have ever seen. It was missing like half of its tail, and it was beat up after the spawn. It was a giant male. That fish was impressive for what it was. Um, I know, Jared, you can probably attest. You don't see very many males that are pushing 44, 45 inches. Oh, at all. Yeah. That's a huge male. Yeah, it was, <laughs> that fish was impressive. And uh, it was beat up. And my first words after we let that go was, I want to see the fish beat that boy up. <laughs> I want to <laughs> see the big girl that beat her, beat him up. Um, mine, my longest one was 49 and three quarters. My heaviest one was 49 and a half. Um, the 49 and a half was, I think it was by 23 or by 24. I forget off the top of my head, but it was a, a very chunky fish. Yeah. And I, and I think, Again, and, and this is, I don't know, this is just me thinking out loud. So, Evan, you mentioned about that, you know, about a 43, 44-inch fish. I mean, to like 97% of the anglers in Pennsylvania, that is an absolute giant fish. fish and I think man. sometimes, yeah, I mean, it's a fish of a lifetime. I mean, sometimes, I don't know if it's fair to say we lose sight of that. But, you know, I, I think about that a lot because that's a big fish, man, like 43, 44 inches. And, I mean, I caught my personal best in PA this past last spring, and it was just at 44 inches. And that was by far the biggest fish I had, you know, I had seen to the point where, you know, netting a fish that was, I think I've netted maybe one or two fish that was bigger than that this year. And it's still, to me, you know, the biggest fish I'm going to hold. It was even, it was even bigger than, 
the the next fish I caught at 45 inches, you know, there were just more weight on that fish. And, you know, the countless fish that you guys have seen this year, I mean, you guys put a ton of fish in the net and think about all the fish that you lost. And I think Jared, I just wanted to mention that because that is literally, you know, we're seeing the product of your labor, you know, and a lot of guys saw the best years they've had on the water last year. I mean, I've heard multiple people say that. So, you know, the work that you guys put in and have been putting in over the last couple of years, I mean, it really, you know, me being green at this, maybe I don't see that as much as maybe say Evan, you know, you've been fishing a lot longer. Um, guys like Joel Morrow, where you know, we talk, he talked about, you know, what it was 10, 15 years ago fishing, you know, it's just, man, it's, it's such a crazy thing to think about how awesome that is, you know, here, here at home in PA. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned something, you know, to that effect, because it just, all the hard work you guys put in, man, it translated into a lot of good <laughs> angling years for people around the state. Uh, you guys that means a lot, you know, and I, I think that, that says a lot and I'm happy to hear that. And I can't wait. I mean, can you imagine as long as this success continues, what the fisheries are going to be like in eight years? You know, like, oh, dude, dude, five years even, it's going to be incredible. Yeah. All these thirty-inch fish are going to be huge, and yeah. you know, five to eight years are going to be monsters. And if we can keep this, keep the survivability going, so there's always a, a steady stream of younger ones coming in. It, I just can't imagine how incredible it's going to be. Yeah, the, the thirty-six to thirty-eight, thirty-nines right now. What that's you give them to those fish four or five years, and now they're forty-five plus. I mean, that's. That's a significant amount of fish <laughs> that are 45 plus inches. Right, right. Yeah, I got a question. Jared, you were catching some giant channel cats up this <laughs> summer up there. I saw some some big posts on Facebook with you and your kids and some big old channels. I tell you what, it was a lot of just the main lake up there in yep. Erie. Yep, out in the main lake of Lake Erie. You know, mostly we, we spend the first half of the summer just trolling for walleyes. And then uh, once we get all the freezers full, as long as I'm, if I'm fishing for myself, I'm staying pretty shallow. And uh, we just kind of stumbled upon that, that pattern where we're using um, large, like one ounce jig heads that have a little bit of a spinner on them, putting a night crawler on there and just really slow trolling these things right down the bottom. We're still catching our limit of walleyes in, you know, 20 foot of water, but then we're catching those giant catfish with them. And those cats are a blast. You know, you, you put a 12 year, put a <laughs> down rigging rod in a 12 year old's hand with one of those 20 pound channel cats. <laughs> it's incredible. They about fall over once they get the fishing because they're physically exhausted. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot of fun. That was That's awesome. Those pictures. I just had to comment about that. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty neat. Because I know we caught, we caught some big channel cat. Big, I caught one of the biggest channel cats in my life this fall, actually, up at Arthur. And I know uh, we caught some big flatheads. At, well, Evan caught some big flatheads this year. Too. Really? Nice. Uh, right in your backyard up there. What's that? Right in your backyard up there. Oh, really? Yeah. Trolled for muskies and pine tuning. Who would have thought? <laughs> wow. Those flatheads are, they're, they're aggressive buggers, aren't they? They sure are. <laughs> yeah. They're a handful once you get a hold of them. We catch we get them on our trap nets. You know, the first couple of years, you know, I was fit, trap net and pine tuning. I'd, I'd see a big flathead in there and I'd get all excited. And I'd reach down in there with one hand, grab a hold of the jaw. You know, that thing starts gator rolling. <laughs> it's going to rip your arm off, you know? <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize they have a lot of power. You know what's more fun than whenever you have them in a live well in your boat and you have them in there all night and you go to weigh in in a tournament and you have to get them out. They regain all their energy and they're ready to fight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good time. <laughs> I don't know why. I just went straight to like noodling for some reason. Just like, <laughs> it's like, like, yeah. it's like yeah. noodling out of the, wow. Yep. Wow. Yeah, he'll take a beating real quick. Yeah, Especially absolutely. This big 40 inch plus flat he's like that all right jared i got two more questions i guess what other you know projects are you guys working on in 2021 is there anything of of note and it's okay if there's not anything off the top of your year. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to think of my list of projects is just a mile long and it's every year it's just a struggle on how to prioritize them. Um, you know, right now our biggest push is on hatchery appearance stuff. So, you know, we've been so short on money for so long and we finally got a license increase. So, you know, fishing boat commission wide, you know, our, we have a really big, strong push on cleaning up the hatcheries, making sure they look like a place that, you know, takes care of their equipment and takes care of their facility and people come to visit and they, they feel like we're doing a good job for them. You know, that's always been something that's important. And I think, you know, the Lionsville hatcheries always looked pretty good, but, you know, because that's a big push like right now, we're, we're taking the opportunity to make sure we're getting, getting everything done that we might've let go over the years. You know, we're getting a lot of roofs done and, you know, some rusty metal roofs that um, just got neglected over the years, you know, we're making sure all that matches and looks nice. So when people come to visit, they, it looks professional. Um, and we care too much about our jobs to let people think that we don't care, you know, so so it's important to get that kind of stuff done. Um, we have some water line projects that are going to free up some more well water for the, you know, eventually it'll feed to the musky program, but, you know, the direct benefit's going to be the, the brown trout program right now. Um, just some old infrastructure, you know, we have um, pipelines that are shared between the hatch house and the brown trout unit where it just doesn't have to be set up that way. Each one of those places should have their own dedicated line. So when we make water adjustments at one place, we're not affecting the the water flow at the other side. So a lot of things like that, um, a lot of things that wouldn't be too exciting to everybody on the street, but um, they've been a long time coming for us and it'll make our lives a lot easier. So um, we're always working on something. Um, next time you come in, you know, we've been shut down for so long. You'll notice yeah. all of our roads have been tar and chipped now. Our parking lots are tar and chipped. Um, all our man doors are nice and replaced and shiny. Everything's looking pretty good. So um, but, but that takes a lot of work, you know, we only have, you know, with COVID, I, you know, like I said, we, we've been two positions short, you know, this pretty much this whole season, you know, and we'd fill it and the person would decide to take a job with, you know, the parks or something and leave and then we get another person and then two people would be out on COVID leave taking care of their kids and, it's, you know, it's been a, it's been a long season, but we didn't really feel like we sacrificed at all. We got, we met all of our fish goals. Um, and we made a lot of these projects, you know, just, well, there's just, okay, we're going to stop. We're going to take these three days and paint a stairwell, or we're going to clean out this old junk, just junk area beneath this old stairwell. We're going to put in some nice storage bins. And, you know, a lot of projects like that, that have, should have been done decades ago. And, you know, it just gets easy to overlook them as you're focused on raising bigger and better fish, but it's also important, you know, and keeping up the image to, of the fish and boat commission to the, uh, for the people that are visiting is important. And, if you see it as just as important, then it, it makes it worth the time to do that. Well, I got yeah. a question for you kind of in regards to that. So now when you guys, you, you just said you get a lot of well water or spring water for the raceways and the hatchery fish. Mm -hmm. Do you guys ever, I guess the word would be temper the water in any way, play around with the chemistry in that to make, like pH or anything like that or hardness to try to make it better for the fish or are they just, you just assume that they're used to it or they're going to get used to it because they're coming from similar water. And do you ever, in regards to how you said they go to like the brown trout house first and then they go to the thing, is that just that it overflows from the brown trout and it's essentially recycled water going to the secondary fish? Not recycled. I don't want to make it sound like it's a bad term, but just, the same level of water going versus every group potentially getting their own fresh, fresh water. Yeah, no, it was, um, we don't do any recycled water. Um, we're actually looking at it, maybe recycling some just for the brown trout unit so we can have more units open. So we don't have to have the fish still crammed up. We can space them out a little more, use the same water twice and then discharge it and just spread the fish out. They'll build a feed a little better. But other than that, we're not, um, all of our water is direct in and direct out. Um, and the, what I was referring to was our well water, we have four different wells. They all pump the water up to um, the highest place on the hatchery up on top of the hill. And then we gravity feed that water down from there to anywhere we want it on the hatchery. And the way the direction coming towards the hatch house is just one big 10 inch pipe. And then halfway down the hill, it flies off and goes to the hatch house and goes to the brown trout unit. 
which isn't a big deal and especially wasn't when they created the hatchery because they didn't raise enough fish to make it a problem. But right now we have 50,000 channel catfish in the hatch house, 400,000 steelhead and 400,000 brown trout. So our hatch house is jam packed. Plus we, have the, plus we have the brown Three. trout raceways that are running jam packed full with our brood fish. So that pipe is running full bore. Yeah. So once you have that pipe running full, anytime you make an adjustment, it either has to give it to or take it from the other spot. You know what I mean? So we're no longer at a place where we have this big 10 inch line of water that we can draw from whenever we want. Well, every time we turn a valve open, we got to think, okay, what am I stealing from and are they going to be okay? So once we get those two lines separated, then we'll be able to give the brown trout all the water they want. And we'll be able to give the hatch house all the water they want. So that's that's one of our number one projects coming up for the this coming year. Yeah, that's I mean, that's all stuff that helps you guys, you know, I guess work more efficiently and it really helps take care of the fish. And the other thing you had mentioned about the cosmetic things that needed done, I mean, right on the site it says average annual visitors. I guess aside from COVID, we're gonna throw all that out. 80,000 visitors you guys get at the hatchery annually. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. It is a lot of people coming in and out. So, I mean, those are, those are good points. I mean, that's all good information. And, you know, I think I just, you know, I think it's, that is a really cool thing too. When you're in the area, you can just swing by the hatchery and, and take a look at what you guys have going on there. You know, I think it's fun for the kids too, personally, but yeah, so that's cool. Hopefully, we can get out of these COVID scenarios and and get everything back to normal, so you guys can open up, so we can get get out there and visit. Yeah, that'd be nice. We're we're anxious to have some visitors. It's a little too quiet around there. <laughs> All right, one last question, then I'll I'm gonna let everybody go. Um, I I just want to ask about the steelhead program because this is one thing that I was able to do. Was it this year? I think it was late last year. I think it was late last year before Christmas. Um, so it's been a long time since I fished for steelhead. It's been a, it was a long time since I was up to the Great Lakes area to do that. So my question is like how, I guess, thinking about the program, like what, what efforts do you guys have to get those fish in place and how do you supplement the fishery? Like, is there any information you can give us on the steelhead program? I know there's probably a lot there that we don't have time for, but. Yeah, I mean, I can, so the the steelhead fishery is pretty much a 100% stocked fishery. Um, there is a few um, gravelly small tributaries where they do have some successful natural reproduction, um, but generally the life cycle of a salmonid like that, like the steelhead is, once they hatch, those, um, the smolts would stay in that stream for the, for the first year, go through the smultification process and then go out migrate to the, the big water body. And there's almost no, none of those tributaries that stay cold enough for trout to survive. Although there's plenty that do, you know what I mean? Like that's the first thing to, to say is when I say that, I mean any enough that are gonna significantly, significantly attribute to the fishery. You know, there's, you can go out to any of the streams and in July and catch a, a six, seven inch, steelhead so we know they do it it's just it's not going to ever be 1.1 million that we stock you know what i mean it's it'll be an extra 10,000 or something like that it doesn't contribute in a meaningful way so it's a it's a 100% stocked program the idea you know way back in history um, when the lampreys were introduced to the great lakes the lampreys did put a big hit on the the lake trout which were the apex predator in the great lakes so when the lake trout population crashed is when the Great Lakes community started looking for other species to take over that role. Um, and back in the day, that's when they started stocking coho salmon and king salmon. And uh, those were really super popular fisheries. Um, but the problem was they die after spawning. So you didn't get a lot of bang for your buck. So then when we went to the steelhead, um, you know, they come in and anglers can catch them and they go back out and in theory, you could have the same fish come in five or six years and provide entertainment for the anglers uh, for a long time if they don't get harvested. Um, so it's exciting that it's 100% stock and it's such a huge popular thing. You get, I mean, just the migration of anglers coming to this area every every fall is just incredible. Um, what do you want to know? What do you want to know about the steelhead program? So I'm, eat some walleye, save steelhead smolts. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I don't know. I mean, it was just, I was just kind of, I guess, taken back slightly by the number of people there, you know, during the week to where, where we were fishing. And, you know, honestly, that was probably more fish that I had seen in the, in the tributary, maybe ever, you know, that yeah. far up. And I mean, I spent, when we were younger, I spent, spent a lot of time like at the mouth of elk and you know like slightly off the beach at trout run we'd go down there and look at the fish and stuff but like i had not seen that many fish like upstream in a long time you know i didn't spend that much time and it was just really cool seeing that many fish and i guess i, I don't know i always use the term interact because i i hooked and lost a lot of fish the first day we were out and you know, it was just, I don't know, it was just so much fun. Like I wanted to ask about it because it's not something that I've done, you know, regularly enough. And it was so long since I did it. I was just curious, you know, like how much that program has expanded. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible program. So, you know, the, the Great Lakes region, you know, all the states that surround Lake Erie, they all get together and decide which, which they only, you know, obviously we don't want to put too many salmonids in the lake. So they decide what states are going to stock how many fish and our allotment. In Pennsylvania, we're allowed to stock 1.1 million salmonids every year. So we break that down into 100,000 brown trout and a million steelhead. Now, the Thai Nesta hatchery raises about 740,000 of those, and then the rest are raised at the Fairview hatchery. And uh, it takes a lot of work getting all those eggs and collecting all those brood and taking them back to the Fairview hatchery and collecting all those eggs out of them. They just did another, the last collection today. It was nine degrees up there this morning. And, Guys were out there collecting those brood out of trout run. And then um, and all those fish go back to the time nest, the hatchery, and they, they hatch them. And, you know, we hatch about 400,000 of them over at the Lionsville hatchery. And then uh, we'll get them up to three or four inches and send them up to the Fairview hatchery to be raised the rest of the year. And then time nest has got raceways full of them all year long. And uh, it's, a, it's a major stocking event that you never hear about. You know, yeah. Time Nest is just getting ready to start going. They'll run three trucks a day out of there for, you know, a month and a half every single day trying to get all those steelhead up to those streams. It, it's a massive program. It's, it takes a ton of work. And, uh, but it's a blast. You know, I live right here in McCain, you know, like I said, two minutes from Rick Road. You know, I, I fish Elk Creek a lot. I fish Walnut Creek a lot. I love it, you know, and I probably have my best year this year that I've ever had. Um, and well, I say that, but you know, it's not, it isn't, you'll hear a lot of people complain that it's not like it was back in the early nineties when you could you know, go down there and catch a fish on every cast and catch 40 fish in a day. You know, it was, we didn't have the crowds back then when the, when the fishery first started taking off. So there wasn't as much pressure on the fish and it is what it is. You know what I mean? Like it's as exciting as that was back then, I have more fun now when I can go down to Rick Road and have, you know, five guys there just kind of BS with while you're fishing. Everybody's having a great time. You catch five or six fish. That's a great day. You know, I yeah. I don't need to go down and catch 30 steelhead to make it, you know, or, or as good as it once was kind of thing. You know, your arm gets tired catching 30 steelhead, you know, as long as you're out there having fun. That's what it's all about. And, mm. you know, Average size is great this year, too. This is the biggest one of the largest years I've seen for average size. Yeah, everybody agrees on that. And I'm not really sure how to explain that. You know, I don't know where last year's kind of a poor run compared yeah. to this year, but where were those fish? Those fish, you know, those have to be three and four year olds. So why were they at two and three? I don't know why they weren't there last year, but there's a lot of things we can't explain yet. There's a lot of things we're trying to learn. You know, some interesting things on the steelhead program, some theories that are going around is it seems like there's a theory going around that, Okay, so when you stock a when you stock a smolt, it's you know they've got those little par marks on the sides of them, and they actually go through a a, a smoltification process. That's a lot like a, a butterfly going from a caterpillar into a butterfly. Um, you know they go from that smolt into a fish, and when they go through that process, that's when they they take that imprint of the smell of the stream where they're at, um, and. Obviously, you know, when you go out, you talk to the salmon hatcheries out west, they're doing a lot with, you know, measuring hormone levels in these fish on a daily basis to find that exact perfect time to stock them. But, you know, you know, in our situation with the manpower that we have, you got a lot of a lot of those fish, you know, 740,000 fish in a few raceways. 
they're in a, they're a lot of them are in different stages. So we try to pick when a majority of the fish are in their proper stage, you know. So you always got some that are too big, some are too small when we stock these fish. But the ones that go in at the perfect time and print on the stream perfectly are the ones that are going to come back to that spot. The other ones tend to roam a little bit. Maybe they'll go over to Cascade Creek or, you know, Four Mile Creek, or they'll end up in New York or Ohio. You know, you have a little bit of that, but we get some of their fish too. So it's a little bit of a wash. Um, but those fish that imprint perfectly, they seem like they're coming back to the exact spot where they're, where they're raised and they're stopping instead of just keep going forever. As long as they have water in their face, they'll go to the Legion Hole in Gerard because there's a little feeder stream that comes in there that makes itself the smell of that spot just perfect for where they're stocked at and they'll stop. So one of the ways we're going to try and test that is we've stocked some fish way up in Conneaut Creek further than we ever have before. And we'll see in three years or so if they start returning back to that area better than they ever have before. And that'll kind of answer that question for us. But we're always looking at different, you know, just neat things to learn like that, that we might be able to use, once we know that, then we'll be able to use that to better target certain areas for the anglers, you know, things like that. That is really cool stuff. Everybody needs to eat more walleye too. There's way too many of those things waiting for those little smolts to come out to the- Yes. It's going to be- <laughs> It's going to be difficult getting all those small spots the walleyes for a couple of years. <laughs> that walleye oh. population is unbelievable. Was it still was it still booming this year? I didn't get out oh. there and fish walleyes at all. It's but incredible. It, I heard the the Western Basin twenty what twenty twenty trawl was like their younger the year was like the second highest ever on record for this last yep. year. So, yeah, so it, that's, that's like three insane years, like three top five ever in a row years yep. so it, it's going to be nuts absolutely just a lot of a lot of stuff to be excited about as a fisherman i feel like i mean yeah really i mean every program you guys have touched and come up with i mean it's given anglers of all types opportunities to catch fish throughout the entire state i mean it's just it's really cool. You know, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm personally thankful. I don't have to go very far to find somewhere to fish, you know, and that's traveling three and a half hours one way was years, you know, a couple of years of doing that. It burnt me out. And it's so nice to just be able to stay at home and do what we love to do, you know? So I guess, I mean, that's all the questions I have, Jared, uh, Evan, Charlie, you guys have anything else you want to ask Jared? I'm good. Good. You know, one of the things I didn't want to, you know, a lot of the conversations we've had here, I wasn't thinking this when we came into the interview, but, you know, what it's making me feel is that, you know, and I really appreciate this about you guys is like, you guys always have such a great attitude and look at the positive side of things. And, you know, and that's what I try to stress to people is like the fishing boat commission as a whole, you know, it's never, ever going to be perfect. There's always going to be things people can find to complain about if you want to, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's an organization that I'm proud to be a part of and everybody's heart is in the right place. You know, I, I can get frustrated at times. This person made the wrong decision. It's going to affect this or this patient, but it's small stuff. Everybody's making those decisions because they honestly believe that's what's best for the anglers. And every meeting I'm in, every every bureau meeting I go to, every um, outreach program I'm a part of, you know, everybody's thinking the exact same way is how can we do what's best for the anglers? And I think it's I think it's a special agency in that way because, um, you know, I see a lot of different agencies that in my opinion, seem to focus on just their own preservation and mm -hmm. kind of existing as an organization more than they do what their mission is. And, you know, I think if people gave us, gave the Fish and Boat Commission a little bit of credit and realize like even when the, something doesn't work out perfect or COVID comes along and all the trout have to be stocked quicker, the other option was not stocking them. You know what I mean? So the best decision we could do is to get them out quick, get them out as fast as possible. And so people could at least enjoy them, you know what I mean? So, but there's always a, a negative way to look at it, but I, all I can ever do is promise people that a lot of people sit down and talk about all these decisions and make the best decision for the anglers. And what more could you ask for, right? <laughs> and you guys talk enough stuff that we can go out and catch whatever pretty much all year round. Like that's what's neat. Like, 
the lakes around here, by the time they start getting, too, it's too cold to launch the boat. I got to bust through too much ice. That's when it's time to go steelhead fishing. I usually get a decent month of steelhead fishing in. And by that time for us, there's not a whole lot of people that want to steelhead fish when it's 30, 28, 30 degrees out. So it's less pressure up there and it's, it's beautiful. And it's, I don't know, there, there's enough people out there that if people really don't feel like they're catching enough fish, they need to either talk to people on those same lakes or there's enough Facebook groups or different organizations that they can go and talk to. And yeah, you might not get the same response you do over, over the internet. Somebody might not be as open, but if you go face to face with somebody, like you said, even in the stream, you're talking with four or five guys in a hole up there at Legion hole or whatever, guys are going to share a little bit about what better they're doing on things like, like say, say they're not eating egg patterns they're eating nymphs or um i can't even think of the name right now stoneflies or something like that you know mm -hmm. guys will tell you that if, if you're struggling and you only got like you haven't had a hit and they got three fish they'll be like all right what are you doing different they'll be like oh, all right <laughs> absolutely i think it's i think jared to your point it's easy for people to to find negative things to 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 just stay on you know i think a lot of people just like to complain. And I, and I honestly do feel that you guys do an incredible job, you know, throughout the entire year, managing everything that you're managing. I've, I felt that way for a number of years and even talking with you has made me even, even true that up in my mind even more, you know, and I, and I feel like it's easy for people to just reach out, like Charlie said, ask the questions and understand it for themselves it doesn't take much to realize how hard you guys work for us as fishermen, you know, and, and everything that you guys do for the fisheries and to manage, you know, the muskie program. And then we're starting to see all these benefits as fishermen, you know, this is a huge deal. And I, this is part of the reason why I wanted to get you on, you know, I, I try to, and I think all of us do, you know, promote the hatcheries and, and try to get people to understand what, you guys do for the fishery and there's no better way to hear it, you know, than, than directly from somebody like yourself to, you know, to sit down and talk to us as fishermen. And, and I just, you know, I guess I'll speak for, for us, you know, thank you very much for all of your hard work and all the efforts you and your team and all the hatcheries really across the entire state do for the fishery. You know, if it wasn't for you guys, we would be in a lot worse shape and we would have to go to Ohio and other states and we would have to travel to, to do what we love to do. So, you know, thank you again for all of the hard work that you put in, you know, every day for us to, to go out and, and do what we love to do. Well, that's great to hear. And, you know, we get no payoff from it other than hearing people like you guys out there enjoying it. So um, that makes all the difference in the world. Um, please continue to help people grow the program. You know what I mean? I when I go talk to the musky clubs, I always spend a few minutes trying to, you know, talk to the talk to the old timers a little bit about those old ways of keeping secrets. And um, you know, I understand the ideas behind it, but the more we grow the program, the more people we get into the program and having success, the, the bigger we can make it happen. You know what I mean? So it's not like you tell somebody your secret and they're going to catch all your fish. You mm -hmm. tell somebody your secret, the program gets more popular, then we give you more fish. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's everywhere. Right. <laughs> well, uh, we'll keep feeding those muskies meatball shaped foods. That's what we want to hear. They, they do eat meatballs. Proven fact. They love them. They love meatballs. <laughs> Meat pies and meatloaf, right, Evan? Yeah. <laughs> I had to throw a cheesy line in there for you, man. I was, I had it planned for like the initial intro, and I failed. I was like, oh, I can't even and say the it. Miners, right? and, and the miners, right? In the miners, there you Put go. Put that one away. That's the flathead bait. Look at that. Yeah. All right, so let, let's wrap this thing up. So I just want to do. So again, Jared, thanks for you know, thanks for coming on and talking to us about you know, the hatcheries and fishing in general. I mean, a lot of the information you gave us was, was pretty fantastic. I think a lot of people that watch this will enjoy it. You know, hopefully we can put this in front of people that really don't know, you know, what the hatcheries do, or they're not thinking about it because I really think this impacts, you know, people mm -hmm. to hear this type of thing. So 
thanks again for coming on. Again, you guys do a great job. Uh, Evan, you want to give us a little plug for for uh, Shaw, Shaw's Bay Company? Shaw's Bay Company. There's going to be no musky shows this year. So uh, about that time, uh, beginning of March, maybe middle of March, I'm going to have a good bit of baits for sale. So stay tuned. Oh, man. So he has enough baits that he can make like five orders. <laughs> 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 well, I am sure they will go quickly. So that uh, that's awesome. And Charlie, you want to give us a quick plug for Muskie's Inc.? I've been trying to end or at least say something about Muskie's Inc. Man, I don't think any of us – well, I know three, at least three of us wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for Muskie's Inc. I mean, uh, I know I wouldn't have caught the numbers I have. I mean, Jared talked about those old timers. I have a very good old timer that's been around – forever that i like to take fish and i didn't get to go fishing with him this last year and it kind of it hurt <laughs> but those legends they're the guys that got it all started uh they thought differently and you can still learn from them and honestly like like jared said like there's still a level of difference between you can still keep some secrets and not tell everybody everything and still put people on fish and uh that's one of those things that I think we're having to learn a little bit, give people enough information, still let them learn enough themselves. I mean, it, there's nothing that's going to beat time on the water. Every body of water is different. Every body of water is different every day, period, even hour by yeah. hour. Um, and that, that knowledge, that's something you get from Muskie's Inc. Or even if you ain't a muskie fisherman for your bass guy, go to Bass Federation or something like that or Trout Unlimited. Uh, you won't get any better fishermen in the state than that are in those clubs pretty much or haven't been there at some point. All right, cool. All right, guys. Well, appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks again for the time tonight. And it was fun talking fishing with you guys. So, uh, all right. Thanks guys. Have a good night. See ya. See ya. All right, Ian's guys, we talked a lot about the state hatcheries Jared gave us some awesome information about the programs. We talked about the voluntary permits, similar to what you guys see here. And really guys, we just talked fishing and hopefully this will help you all to understand what the hatcheries do for our fishing here in PA. Um, they are absolutely critically important to you guys going out there and catching fish. Guys, years back, I just thought these fish naturally reproduced here in PA and I really never thought about the stocking effort. You know, after talking to guys like Jared and really reaching out and talking to different members at Fish and Boat and really doing my research and understanding all of this stuff, you know, even visiting the hatchery with Deanna and I, I've learned so much and I realized just how critically important their work is and really just what they do for us as fishermen. So again, that was my goal with this video. I wanted you guys to see it and hear it from Jared and really Evan and Charlie as local fishermen here in the state of Pennsylvania. All right, guys, if you like this video, hit that like button for me. If you guys like this content overall, please subscribe to my channel. I greatly appreciate each and every one of you guys that support me. Make sure you guys go out and do your research. Take a look at these voluntary permits. You know, that extra 11 or 12 bucks goes to a really good cause. It helps the environment, it helps the habitat, it helps the fisheries and the fish. Really guys, it helps the hatcheries to continue on their work so that we can all do what we love to do right here at home. So go out there, check the permit out. If you guys are serious musky fishermen and you're not a member of Muskies Inc., I urge you guys to go out and check your local chapter. You guys don't have to sign up and be a member right away. Come out to the meetings, come out to the events, talk to guys. I promise you that will pay off. You guys will learn a ton and it'll make you a better fisherman. If you guys are bass fishermen, if you guys are trout fishermen, find a local club. It's only going to make you a better fisherman as you continue to talk to anglers in your local area. So guys, I really appreciate you hanging in there with me through these video casts. There's a lot of good information. I'm having probably too much fun doing this. And again, I'm just super thankful for guys like Jared and guys like Evan and Charlie who want to come on and talk fishing for an hour and a half and really try to help everybody learn something new. And it's just been an absolute blast. We're gonna continue doing this. I've got lots of people lined up for these video casts. 
So hopefully, again, you guys like this. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you guys think. Again, I greatly appreciate all of your feedback. Man, I'll just say it's February 10th. We've got about eight inches of snow outside. It has been cold. But if you guys are out there fishing, I wish you all the best. Stay warm, stay safe. And I'll just say tight lines. We will see Jens next time. <laughs> That's awesome.